the Art of Leadership Network. Hey friends, welcome. I'm so glad you're here today. If you missed the show last week, it's summer break on Win Today. And as such, I want to do something different this month. I want to spend some time one-on-one with you and just teach. No intro music, no ads, just you and me. These episodes will be shorter. And because I care about application after you listen, or maybe even while you listen, I want you to bookmark wintoday.tv slash summerbreak24. That's wintoday.tv slash summerbreak24. Throughout this July series, that will be the landing point for show notes, recommended summer reading, and additional resources like a downloadable PDF study guide for each conversation. So even if you want to get a head start and download the study guide to today's teaching before we get there, go ahead, hit pause, do that now. Go to wintoday.tv slash summerbreak24. All right, well, today I want to nuance an angle of last week's episode about resilience and talk to you about what to do when you're in the middle of adversity. You know, because when you're in the middle of it, perspective is foggy. The adversity itself often clouds our ability to see our circumstance, our safety, and the presence of the Lord accurately. In fact, I've said this before, we don't see the world as it is, we see it as we are. So I want to start with this question today. And take a moment to think about this. What do you do when adversity, fear, and pain are louder, are more pronounced, are more evident than the voice of the Lord. In fact, when they challenge the validity of the covenant promises we read in the word. Well, Psalm 42 presents us with a case study of this exact situation and gives us a roadmap to steer our souls when we're in trouble. So I want you to grab your Bible, turn to Psalm 42 with me. I'm gonna read from the ESV. And at the outset though, I want to point out that Psalm 42 is a lament, and it's what's called a maskil, which is a liturgical term or a musical tune to which this psalm would be sung. But the question is, why did the sons of Korah, who wrote this psalm, sing this psalm as music? Well, I'm a musician, I know this about music. Most likely, so that they would remember it, remember the words, and even memorize it. You guys, that's the power of music. Okay, let's get into the psalm again, Psalm 42, verse one, here we go. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Verse five, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So let's break this down verse by verse to form our thesis today. Psalm 42, as I mentioned, is a lament, and it begins with the psalmist expressing the soul drought he's experiencing and his thirst for the water of God. Here it is, verse one, verse two. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. He's thirsty, he's hungry. He's after the presence of the Lord to infiltrate his circumstance and the adversity he's facing. It's just like us, right? When we are in turmoil, God, I need you. I've got to have you today. I don't know what to do. I need you to break through in the middle of this chaos, right? Well, in verse three, the psalmist writes, my tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, 
Where is your God? You know, in the middle of pain, people speak. They say stupid things. They say things that are somewhat insensitive, but probably not malicious in intent. Sometimes their attempt at consolation isn't helpful, especially when it's delivered as a platitude. But nonetheless, people speak. Tears speak. They tell a story of pain. Adversity speaks. The cynical and embittered heart speaks too. In fact, I think disappointment sometimes mocks God and taunts us. Where is your good God now? If he loved you, if his hand was really on your life, would this be happening? It's a taunt. Sometimes these things, the people, the tears, the adversity are louder than the still small voice of the Lord. And so in verse four, we read the psalmist's attempt at trying to unburden himself from intolerable pain, grief, and agony. He writes, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. And thus the point, grief is not to be ignored. Maybe you're walking through grief right now. You experienced the loss of a loved one. Don't stuff it. Don't stuff it. None of us move on from grief. We move through it. None of us move on. Listen, none of us move on from grief from the losses of our life. We don't take an eraser to that part of our lives from that season. We move through it with the presence of the Lord. Grieving our losses is such a critical exercise in our ability to move forward in life. Full stop, you guys. What we don't stop to grieve will not be fully healed. I want to say that again. Listen, what we don't stop to grieve, to give our soul a break from the frenetic pace of life, what we don't stop to grieve will not fully be healed. And what doesn't get fully healed will come out later in life in a more aggressive, more devastating fashion. This is what uh, counselors call complicated or prolonged grief. Now look at the second part of this verse. The psalmist recounts the prior faithfulness of the Lord. And here's our strategy in adversity. As much as we need to grieve the present loss, we do, it's crucial that we also remind ourselves of the past faithfulness of the Lord in our lives. Psalm 77 verses 11 to 12 says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. You will, my friend. I will too. We will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, he says, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. You see, the psalmist wasn't ignoring what he was walking through. He was strengthening himself in the Lord in the middle of the pain, in the middle of the adversity. We have to do the same thing. And that sets up verses five and six. Here it is, Psalm 42, verses five and six. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Here's the injunction. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. He's not stuffing the pain. He's not ignoring it. He's not throwing a platitude at it. But what he is saying is, soul, I'm going to redirect your focus in the middle of it because the story isn't over yet. He goes on. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mazar. So here it is, in the midst of pain and anguish, what's the posture of the psalmist? He rouses himself, he rouses his soul to fix his focus on the Lord, and he does this by talking to himself. Proverbs 18, 21 says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. We can activate our faith in authenticity by commanding ourselves out loud where to focus when we're in the midst of pain. Now listen, listen closely. This is not the power of positive self-talk. This is not self-help. Self-help is no help. This is about expressing truth over fact. Lord, I'm facing this. I'm seeing this. This is real, but truth is greater than fact. And in a way, the psalmist is correcting himself for his despondency. He's re-aiming the target. He's re-aiming the affections of his mind, his will, and his emotions. You guys, we have to do the same. So in verse six, he says, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, as a result, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mazar. In other words, because my soul is despondent, fearful, and in despair, Lord, I will intentionally compare the size and stature of Yahweh's mountain, Zion, to the little mountain, Mazar. Again, 
He's reestablishing a proper perspective of God's magnitude and sovereignty in light of his own anguish. Now, I, I wanna add a note about self-talk in the power of our words, especially when we are emotionally vulnerable. You know, whenever we are in the deep waters of dire situations, we will be tempted to murder our offenders with our mouths. Listen to it again. Whenever we are in the deep waters of relational turmoil, like betrayal, we will be tempted to murder our offenders with our mouths. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? Sounds gruesome and unnecessary even, right? Well, it's actually the right picture because scripture says that out of the abundance of the heart, actually the super abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it's in the heart where homicide occurs. Listen to James chapter four, verse two. Quote, you are jealous and covet what others have and your desires go unfulfilled. So you become murderers. Here it is. To hate is to murder as far as your hearts are concerned. You burn with envy and anger and are not able to obtain the gratification, the contentment and the happiness that you seek. So you fight in war. You do not have because you do not ask. You know, last year I was facing a really devastating circumstance that came out of the blue, literally out of the blue on a Tuesday. At the height of it, the Lord spoke to me and said, you will not sin with your mouth. I'll never forget, I was driving home and immediately in the midst of confusion and chaos, I had a moment of clarity and I felt the Holy Spirit speak and he said, you will not sin with your mouth in the middle of the circumstance. Well, that's Psalm 39, verse one, which says, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. And in that moment, in the height of what felt like utter betrayal, I had a choice to make. We all do, you guys. The power of life and death is in the tongue and those who indulge in it will eat the fruit of it, listen, whether for death or for life. It's that big of a deal. The words that we speak to ourselves, to others, when we're in the middle of trial are critical. The power of life and death is in the tongue. The question is, which fruit do you wanna eat? Let's go to verse eight. Psalm 42 verse eight says, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. What does that mean? Well. At no point in his daily life was the presence, protection, and provision of the Lord absent from his life. And so it is with us. You guys, I want to double down on this point. Psalm 16 verses 7 through 9 says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. Yes, my heart instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory, my inner self rejoices. My body too shall rest and confidently dwell in safety. What's the point? The presence of the Lord is with us at night and in night seasons, the dark seasons of life. I wanna jump to verse 11 now. Scripture says, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He says, hope in God, for I shall again praise him. God was faithful before. His character does not change. Therefore, we will continue to see his faithfulness now and in the future. Does this hope eliminate the presence of adversity or the trouble he's in at the moment? No, but in it, like the psalmist, we stand on a firm foundation. We might not see it now, but it is there. He is there. He is Emmanuel, God with us, God with you, my friend, right now. Earlier in the conversation, I posed the question to you. What do you do when adversity, fear, and pain are louder than the voice of the Lord? When they challenge the validity of the covenant promises we read in the word? Well, having investigated the case study presented to us in Psalm 42, I want to give you four keys to strengthen yourself in the Lord today in the middle of trouble. So you can jot these down, grab a notebook, put them in your phone, or just download the companion guide at wintoday.tv slash summerbreak24, but I'll give them to you now. Number one, remember. Remember the past faithfulness of the Lord in your life as a lens through which you see present trials. 
In fact, if you're walking through something difficult right now, hit pause. Take a moment to recount a time in your life in which the Lord came through and you made it through. Psalm 42, verse six, which we read earlier, says, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you. In other words, I size my problems up against you and your infinite power, wisdom, and goodness. Again, Psalm 77, verses 11 to 12. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. He wasn't ignoring what he was walking through. He was strengthening himself in the Lord in the middle of the pain. Number two, refocus. Whatever we focus on flourishes. In my book, Healing What You Can't Erase, I said it this way when teaching about the insidious nature of shame. By the way, this is from chapter four, page 70 of the book. Whatever has our identity has our beliefs. Whatever has our beliefs has our thoughts. Whatever has our thoughts has the affections of our hearts. And whatever has our affections has our focus and thus the motivation and direction for our lives because whatever has the most influence over us has us. Again, this proves the strength of a fixed focus. Psalm 16 verse 8 in the ESV says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. I love that. Here's Psalm 121 verses 1 through 3 also from the ESV. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. When we're in trouble, we look up and out, not down and in. We look up and out. This is the way of scripture. This is the way of Jesus. We don't look down and in. This isn't self-help. This is not find the truth of who you are inside yourself because we're not Buddhists. We're disciples of Jesus. We look up and and out, not down, and in. Why? Because whatever we focus on flourishes. My friend, where are you looking in the middle of your trial? Fix your focus. Number three, receive. What will you receive from the Lord today? A fresh perspective, peace that passes all understanding, endurance, and a steadfast spirit. Psalm 42 verse eight says, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love. He doesn't suggest it. He doesn't waver on deciding to do it. He commands it. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Receive his timely provision in your situation today, my friend, not by striving, but by slowing your internal pace, opening your heart and saying, Lord, I receive everything you want to give to me today. Number four, renew. Listen, I want you to renew your I will, renew your resilience as we talked about last week. Psalm 42 verse 11 says, why are you cast down on my soul and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, here it is, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. I will praise him again. I will see his faithfulness. I will, I will, I will. Make that your determination. Speaking about renew and being renewed, I love Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 to 31. He says this, he gives power to the faint. You faint today, you exhausted, you over it. He gives power to you today. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so what do you do when adversity, when fear, when pain are louder than the voice of the Lord? When adversity challenges your ability to perceive the steadfast faithfulness of the one who said, I will never leave you and never forsake you. What do you do? You remember, you refocus, you receive, and you renew. Like David in 1 Samuel 30, strengthen yourself in the Lord today. My friend, he's faithful, his word is true. Until next week, head over to wintoday.tv slash summerbreak24 to download today's free companion guide and grab a copy of my new book, 
healing what you can't erase anywhere books are sold. I hope you enjoyed today's solo episode. If you missed last week's episode all about resilience, go back and listen to that one too. But until next week, have an awesome day. I'll talk to you really soon. See ya.